I'm curious how you started to look at primates more as peacemakers than as animals competing with each other in the evolutionary arena. Well, um, I, I, was in, I was a student in the time that Conrad Lawrence was very influential. I don't know how many people know Conrad Lawrence, but he wrote his book on aggression. And uh, in the 1960s and 70s, no one could talk about human evolution if you didn't talk about aggression. It was all about how aggressive are we compared to other animals and so on. And Lawrence actually had argued that we were more aggressive than other animals. This was a very heated discussion at the time because Lawrence was a, an, uh, a German. He was Austrian, but he served in the German army during World War II. And so in the US, there were many psychologists who didn't like his theories because they saw it as a sort of justification of aggression uh, that he was giving us as a, uh, an, an officer of the German army. So uh, anyway, aggression was the main topic, and I was in charge of studying aggression as a student and al alliance formation, so how, how sometimes two or three monkeys will gang up on another one. And in that context, um, I discovered something that I found actually much more interesting than the aggression, which is that the alternation, the alternation between aggression and peacefulness. So if you look at a monkey group, I was at the time looking not at chimps, but at, at monkeys. Uh, maybe 5% of the time, there is conflict. But 95% of the time, these guys are playing and grooming and doing all sorts of friendly stuff. And I felt that alternation was really interesting. It's how do you get from a fight to that kind of behavior? I'm, I'm myself from a family of six boys. And so <laughs> I'm, I'm very familiar with the cycle. And, and so I got interested in that. But at the time, I did not have the, a, a, a real clue of how this happened. That happened when I studied chimpanzees, which was in the, in the 70s. And there I noticed one day, uh, it was really a, a very specific event that I noticed. One day there was a, a huge fight among the chimpanzees in the winter quarters, which were, they were locked in, 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 in a room maybe three times the size of 25 chimps, which is a small size for 25 chimps. Humans you can keep in a room like this. <laughs> chimps, chimps are more difficult. So they had a huge fight, and um, I followed the whole fight, and then about 10 minutes later, there was an enormous pandemonium where all the chimps were hooting and, and embracing each other and excited. And in the center of that group, there were two chimps embracing who, and this is something, that, and I'm a bit slow maybe, it's only 10 minutes after that that I said, well, those, those were the same guys who were fighting. And so that's where it clicked. Uh, the, word, the Dutch word for reconciliation came to my mind. And from that moment on, I've seen many, many, it's now a whole field. Uh, there's entire books being written about reconciliation in primates. And actually, we know more about the reconciliation process in primates and some other animals than we do in humans. There's, there's more animal studies on it than uh, human studies. So, so that's where I got really um, excited, much more excited by that behavior than by the aggressive behavior, which everyone was studying. And that reconciliation was a surprising behavior that a lot of people initially didn't believe existed. So I had to convince a lot of people who would say, well, oh, maybe chimpanzees, they kiss and embrace after a fight because they don't know what else to do or something like that. You know, they, they came up with all sorts of explanations that have nothing to do with a biological explanation. So that's how I got into this. Now, in, in your book, you talk about a lot of different examples, just taken from natural history in general, not just chimpanzees, of examples of what you might call empathy of, of animals caring for others, of looking out for others. I mean, what, what are some of the most striking examples that, that uh, come to your mind other than these things you saw with chimpanzees? Yeah, uh, the, the, um, the, the impetus for my empathy research, and all these things, they come usually from observation in my case. I'm not like a, a philosopher who sits in a chair and says, what could be interesting to study? It's more like I see my animals do something and that triggers something. So the, the empathy studies came out of the fact that chimpanzees very often when there has been a fight, um, they approach the victim who got beaten up by somebody, uh, sometimes injured uh, and so on. They, they go up to the victim and they embrace the victim and kiss the victim and try to calm him down and groom, uh, groom him and so on. And this is, we call that consolation behavior and you can systematically study that. In chimpanzees it's so common that I have recently had a postdoc who studied 4,000 cases of consolation, so it's a very common behavior. And I, one time I went to a conference on child behavior where a, a psychologist, Carolyn Zahn-Waxler, who uh, is a Wisconsin psychologist, 
she, uh, she, said, she said, well, you know how I study empathy in children. That's as for, and what she did is she, she would go to families. She would instruct a family member to start crying or sobbing or saying, I'm in pain. And then she would study how young children would react. Uh, very young children of one year of age have the reputation of being selfish monsters. And she did not agree with that. She said, well, they show empathic reactions. And so they, she, she actually demonstrated that very young children already walk up to a family in this, a member in distress and try to reassure them. And she said, that's the first sign of empathy in young children. And that's where I thought, well, that's exactly what my children do all the time. And so uh, it's, it's sort of interesting, the history of empathy research in humans, because Carolyn Van Waxler, who was the first to do this, she said that 25 years ago or 30 years ago, um, she could not give a serious, uh, at a serious scientific meeting and talk about empathy, because they classified it with telepathy and with astrology. It, it was, empathy was a, a sort of nebulous phenomenon that no one could define, it had to do with emotions, which are messy anyway. Mm -hmm. And so um, she, she could not get a, a, a slot for a serious presentation on the topic of empathy. And, and that, of course, has completely changed now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But it's not just, I mean, it's not just primates that show signs of empathy. I mean, you can see it in dogs or dolphins, all, all sorts yeah. of different things. I think the reason we have, if, if I would ask in this room, how many of you have an iguana at home? Or a turtle. One there turtle. you go. Two. <laughs> uh, but the reason dogs and cats, everyone will, will stick up their hand. The, the reason we have mammals at home is precisely because with mammals you have an emotional connection. Mammals uh, understand your emotions, you understand their emotions, they react to them. Um, uh, and certainly these reassurance behaviors that I talked about, like consolation behavior, uh, they occur in dogs, they're very well known. Actually, Carolyn Zahn Luxler already mentioned that in her early studies where she tried to test children in the family situation, this was the, the experiment was often disturbed by pets who showed the same reaction. Mm -hmm. 